our body is roughly 20% efficient. That means for every watt that we output physically, we produce roughly four watts thermal. So the temperature is the, the main parameter for people that have struggled falling asleep. So you usually just make your room colder and you'll, it, you'll be much easier to fall asleep. So there's different periods in the company or in the lifeline of a company where you need a different skill set. And sometimes people can easily adapt to it and sometimes not. So then we have to readjust. And Excellent, Wolf. It's uh, good to see you. Pleasure to see you again. Wanted to have this discussion. I've seen you have been developing something super exciting. Last time you showed me in uh, San Francisco, actually. Why don't we start with a brief introduction about yourself, what you're working on? Hey, it's it's a pleasure to be on the podcast. So I had listened to a couple of episodes. It's super interesting, especially for me as an entrepreneur, but also as someone uh that is active in the wearable scene so uh, appreciate uh, that you do this and and super excited to be here so uh yeah i'm wolf i'm one of the um, founders of a company green tech and the founder of core and core is uh, a wearable device that is capable of measuring a person's core body temperature continuously and non-invasively and uh, it's dedicated to the sports audience. So it basically, um, there's different ways of, of using it. You can uh, attach it to your heart rate strap, clip it on there, or just attach it to your body with a, with a sticker. And that's the two ways of using it. Yeah, first question that comes to mind is, I've seen a lot of wearables measuring skin temperature. What's the difference between core body temperature and skin temperature? Well. The skin temperature is just the temperature on your skin, and that is heavily influenced or mostly influenced by the environment or the context. So imagine you're, you have a temperature sensor on your skin, and now you put on a jacket. What will happen is that, well, skin temperature rises, but your core temperature most likely won't change. Same if now winter on the Northern Hemisphere, you go outside, skin temperature drops your core temperature remains stable and people in the in the field have tried to solve that just with algorithms and it's it's a more difficult task than than people would think so what what people are if you're interested in health so then you're interested in a in a physiological parameter what is coming a signal from the body so and if you just look at skin temperature it's mostly a signal that gives you a context what is what is this person doing is it is he going to put on a blanket or is he going outside or was the window opened i mean that can be interesting data but it's not what you what most people are looking for mm. and how does how does the core body temperature change does it change every minute for example does it change every 10 minutes and does this happen i believe it, it happens through activity so how does it uh, work there yeah here, I mean, what is why do we have a core temperature? So our body, the most important parts are the where the organs are, and they have a preferred temperature, and that's why we have something called thermal regulation. So it the body tries to keep all the important parts of the body at that temperature because that's the temperature where they like to operate and they function best. And so usually that is around thirty seven degrees. And the the core temperature is pretty stable as long as there's no heavy disturption, right? And there is some natural swing into it. So usually what we see is that at night, the body temperature drops around half to one degree, whereas during the day, you have like a little increase. So you can go up to 37.5 during the day and you drop to 36.5, sometimes 36 during the night. And that is really at rest uh, when the body recovers, it, it drops a temperature. And this, this uh, it's kind of a sinusoidal swing and it's a 24 hour uh, rhythm and it's, it's correlated to your circadian rhythms or your inner clock. And that's just one interesting aspect of it. Now, if it comes to sport, we see changes and those changes can occur rapidly and why do they happen so if we work out we use our muscles and we produce uh, an 
force. And unfortunately, this is not super efficient. Uh, and you can comp compare it to a combustion engine. So also our body is roughly 20% efficient. That means for, for every watt that we output physically, we produce roughly four watts thermal. So, uh, you know, some numbers from cyclists, if they do 300 watts, they, they have 1.2 kilowatts of thermal output. And now humans are pretty good in dissipating heat through various mechanism. Uh, the, the normal first mechanism is the body transports blood to the skin, to the surface, um, also to the extremities, the arms, legs, the, uh, the face. And um, there, there is a heat exchange with the environment and the blood is cooled down and with the blood you cool your body. Now, if um, you produce a lot of heat <clears throat> and if on top, there it's it's a hot environment or you wear a lot of clothing then this is uh not sufficient anymore and another mechanism kicks in which is sweating so here we have evaporation which gives you a cooling effect which is which again you still need the blood to transport then this cold uh, colder blood uh, and uh, into the body again and but even with sweating and all the heat exchange uh, sometimes we come to that limit, and especially if it's hot outside, and we cannot dissipate all the heat that we are internally generating. And this is then the heat starts accumulating within the body, and the core temperature starts rising. And the body doesn't like that, so it keeps working against it. It starts pumping more blood. That's when <laughs> you know I usually get a red face when I run. And now this means a conflict because the same system is used to fuel our muscles so we need to bring oxygen and uh, to to all the muscles and now um, if we need to cool a lot then we need some part of the heart capacity the pumping capacity and parts of the blood to to achieve the cooling and that is missing for bringing the oxygen to the thighs if we're cycling for example and usually we see a performance drop then. And what's really useful for athletes? I believe uh, the lower you keep your temperature while, while exercising is better. But am I right? Or how does this work? Yes. I mean, we, you know that uh, we need warm muscles to, to have a good performance. But if they get too hot, then this can be detrimental to the, to the performance. And first what i just explained we can see if if the body want needs blood and heart pumping capacity for cool for cooling this is not there anymore for delivering oxygen so we have a problem with the oxygen supply then on the on a on a deeper level within the muscle there's also then some yeah biochemical reactions that can be uh, detrimental and uh, if the muscle gets too hot yeah basically the it becomes less efficient and so yeah it's not good to be on a on a too high temperature and we need to to keep that in check and in balance and mostly athletes are trained to ignore some signals and pain and so they 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 go hard and keep going hard and even if they go <laughs> they have to go slower a bit uh, they keep going on and it could uh, theoretically get critical so that that is really the the sad part it usually just rather happens to amateur athlete that they overdo it and overheat and and they're running in, into a heat exhaustion which basically the body switches into some kind of emergency shutdown and you're you cannot move anymore and you you simply break down just to shut off the the let's say the heat generating part that's like the the ultimate uh, uh what your body can do to stop it that's a very interesting topic i will uh i will bring up the conversation in a bit but i wanted to also hear what's the journey with core how did you actually think about the idea in the early days so it dates back to uh, 2019. So the background is there is a company behind Core, Green Tech, and they do thermal sensors. And 
we had uh, realized that our, our main sensor technology, which are heat flux sensor, is the key to solve this problem of measuring uh, a core body temperature. And we had looked what applications would be um, accessible for such a solution. And we had thought of sports, talked to the likes of, uh, of a polar, but they said nobody's interested in the sports domain in this parameter. And so we thought, okay, there's obviously some need in in the medical space. So we we kept developing the solution and and you know had had customer projects, but we had put the sports side aside. And yeah, back in October uh, 2019, it was basically more a uh, private incident. So as as a father and entrepreneur, I'm I'm usually quite busy and I, I hardly ever watch TV and so my wife was off with the kids and I allowed or I treated myself with some TV time after a long day of work and uh, yeah I, I, I'm passionate about sports so I switched into the sports channel and there was the the Ironman World Championship in Kona going on and it's a lengthy uh, competition, so then they were they were showing in between. They were switching to a scene that happened earlier the year, and that was in 2019 July, I think, the Ironman in Frankfurt. And there was an incident with an athlete, U.S. athlete Sarah True. She was in the lead, uh, like by seven and a half minutes, I believe, after nine hours of competition, 700 meters to the finish line of the full Ironman. And then she she crumbled and and yeah experienced basically a heat stroke and and couldn't finish. And I thought, well, damn, we we would have a solution for this if she had known or been advised like 10k prior, she could have you know run into the next aid station or basically walked the the last five kilometers and and still you know claimed her Kona spot or qualified for Kona that year. And then I did a bit of research and I found out that uh, the same thing happened to her earlier the same year. So I thought like, okay, it obviously has a relevance in sports and uh, people were talking about it. The commentary were talking about it in on TV, that core temperature was critical. And uh, so I thought, okay, there's definitely a, a use case in the sports domain. So I went back to the next day to the office and said like, hey, we're not going to wait for the big guns. We, we're going to do our, our variable ourselves. And there wasn't much time, but to, to set a high goal, I said like, our goal is to be on the Olympic marathon champion in Tokyo 2020. And, uh, you know, people thought I was crazy, but, uh, you know, a few interns were, seemed to like the idea. And so we, we picked it up. I had someone in mind who, who I thought would be a great product person to drive this project. I called him up, uh, yeah, one day later and basically got him excited. And then we, we started the project and within, let's say, record time, we, we created the hardware we had. The manufacturing, I actually reached out to the coach of of Sarah True, and it's Dan Lorang. He's an, a Luxembourgian coach, and he's also the coach of that year's Ironman champions, both male and female, like um, Jan Frodeno and Anna Hauk. So I thought, oh, he's like the number one in the in the game, and uh, yeah, I was hesitating to reach out, but then I was afraid to miss that opportunity so i i just you know link reached out on linkedin he was super friendly was willing to meet i met him in january 2020 and uh and uh, he was excited and uh, we agreed that we would uh, test it with him and his team because it he's also a coach in a in a in a World Tour Cycling Team, Bora Hansgrohe. So we agreed to be joining the, the training camp and um, that was planned for March. So we had a clear target by March. We need to have like functional prototypes working um, to, to measure on these athletes. And so we, we got everything going. We had the prototypes. We went there and w like two days into the training camp, COVID hit. That was in, in Spain. Everything was shut down. Chris 
had to go back by bus, you know, that there were no planes flying anymore. And pretty much every um, sports event was canceled for the year, <laughs> including the Olympics. So there goes my business plan. <laughs> we're creating a sports product and, and all, all big sports events are called off. Nevertheless, yeah, we uh, luckily they decide uh, to still, even though the, the Tokyo Olympics were pushed out by a year, which gave us more time, um, but they decided to have the, the Tour de France in, in pushed out from July to September and then liked the technology and, and how it worked. And so he thought like, oh, we give it a shot and try it during the Tour de France. And so that was our next goal. We went there, they used it. We couldn't openly talk about it, but uh, it, it just uh, word of mouth in the peloton. Everybody saw it, talked about it. And yeah, I think right one week after the tour, we the, the Giro d'Italia also delayed started. And, and that was then, uh, we already had like three more teams and and then, to one week or two weeks into the Giro, the Vuelta started and there was another two or three or five teams. So we had like half of the peloton within half a year using or trying our, our technology. And yeah, from that, it made like other athletes jumped on it. Dan also introduced us to um, Olaf uh, Alexander Bu, who's the coach of the Norwegian triathletes. Back then... Uh, not everybody knew them, but um, yeah, he they were like really data driven and, and and tech driven, and so Olaf really immediately grasped the the concept and jumped on it, and uh, we started a very deep collaboration, finally yielding to yeah Christian Blumenfeld winning the Olympics and and later on also. Uh, much more world championships and Gustav Eid and his colleague week were winning Kona. In the meantime, as a precaution, the Tokyo Olympics had decided to move the marathon away from Tokyo to the northern island of Hokkaido, 800 kilo- kilometers north, just to avoid the heat. So we couldn't like fulfill that claim anymore for the winning the marathon. Even though I heard like some of the marathon runners apparently used it, we don't have track of everything. But yeah, we had an Olympic champion uh, a year later, and besides uh, the the triathlon, we had much more. Um, for example, Richard Carapaz, who won the the road race men's road race he usually he was an ineos rider and they have a dark jersey so you never see the the core if they if they wear it now because it's underneath the jersey now in the olympics he raced for uh ecuador am i right yes and they have a white jersey so it was it was great he won the olympics and you could perfectly see uh him wearing the core then we had uh, a surprise winner, the Austrian um, for the female, Anna Kiesenhofer. And she had, like, she's a mathematician, so he, she's not even a professional. And she had talked on Twitter about using and testing our sensor. So it made a bit of a wave in the in the circling, cycling world. And so, yeah, here we are. <laughs> and it's a pretty good penetration with professional sports. And now our task is... is to bring it also to amateurs and, and other sports. You mentioned word of mouth, and I'm wondering, what do you think is the most valuable thing that the athletes could find? Like, would it be because they could train specifically at a certain temperature, or is it because they would know when they needed to reduce their speed, for example, or how would they use the sensor? And then also I wanted to ask you about how do you really sell to such big athletes but maybe let's keep it for a second question Mm. so this is a very good question (laughs) and we're we're still on that right how do we deliver and and show value to the to the user now with a professional athletes it's somewhat easier because they have a coach to 
let's say, uh, digest some, some more technical stuff and, and just tell them what to do and how to interpret. And so that was our early entry into the, into the sports, just collaborating with the coaches. So what, how does it help? So first of all, and, and the reason why people wanted to use it to prepare for Tokyo is everybody was expecting the, the hot, humid climate climate there and hot and humid is a is a worse combination because the, the humidity basically brings down the dew point and and impairs sweating as a as a mechanism that's why a humid hot humid environment is so much more strainful than a hot dry environment so um usually it was it was not nothing new that uh, people would do something like a heat adaption or acclimatization but there were just rough protocols where you basically say, okay, you just go there two weeks in advance and you do your normal training and initially it will feel harder and then you know, you'll know you be acclimatized after a while. And studies show this can take something between five and 12 days. Um, yeah. Now the athletes were only allowed to arrive five days before their competition to Tokyo. So, a full normal acclimation wasn't possible protocol. And so what what at the core allows is to, to really optimal drive this process and even do it in different environments because all that matters is that your body is at an elevated temperature and yeah, is is exercising. And this is triggering than the adaption of the body. If you exercise with an elevated temperature, your body will start adapting by optimizing the, its cooling. And the, it optimizes its cooling by, for example, earlier sweat, sweat onset, but also by how to perfectly distribute and, and steer basically all your valves to, to bring the blood to the right positions in the right amount to, to get the most effect effective cooling and what you usually see is that over over time by doing training at elevated temperatures over time for the same load in the same environment you will not heat up as fast and that means directly you can basically output more power so mm. and now the the good thing is when you train to a temperature you can always adapt so after a few days of training you will have to push harder to get to the same temperature level and then get the same effect of training if you would just gauge that with the environment and and like a power load you will after a while not get the same let's say uh, load or or trigger to your body it will be just lower and the effect will diminish or you overdo it and you have then detrimental effect if you if you overpace and you overheat so that's why it's a useful tool for this acclimation but another thing that that people had studied and also observed just on a empirical level is during covid a lot of athletes were forced to train indoor especially in cycling so a lot of people did and some people used the fan just uh, intuitively to cool down and some didn't and those who didn't like by by accident practice some heat training and the the performances we saw in the 2020 tour de france were like absolutely astonishing very high level like of the levels of of back let's say Lance Armstrong level <laughs> and 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 like retrospectively it could be explained that they basically practice some some kind of a heat training also and uh, what the studies then showed if you do a, a heat training over the period of an acclimatization and continue to do that you will even see some physiological adaptation so what the body does is it it will build more blood plasma so you the the mm -hmm. liquid in your blood so you have more liquid to work with to to cool and to transport oxygen and blood and now it also detects then a lower concentration of red blood cells of hemoglobin and it will eventually start the process of building more hemoglobin and you you end up with an effect similar to an altitude training so you will the body will start more red blood cells and 
and you can conserve this if you have a steady yeah heat training protocol you don't have to to keep it you don't have to do such extensively but you can you can now combine heat training with altitude training but you always have to hit the right dose and and the core helps with that so that is let's say the performance gaining part of 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 heat training and and ideally done with a with a core sensor yeah and another advantage that people quickly realized is yeah strategic cooling or external cooling so something we we can probably take a little bit of credit for if you would if you're watching race footage uh, both in in ironman or triathlon as well as in cycling from four years ago versus now now almost every athlete takes every opportunity to go to the aid station and not only pour water drink water but pour water over himself you know put ice everywhere i'm i'm assuming that in the meantime at a tour de france like 80 percent of the water they distribute to the riders is not drunk but but rather spilled over themselves and and we could really see that in the signals that it's super critical to take layers off uh, of clothing off early enough before a climb yeah even sprinkle yourself on top of a mountain or halfway down to to get the maximum cooling effect uh, so you go with a lower temperature into the next climb so that is is another advantage and and finally yes there's the pacing part but nobody wants to let's say slow down but what what you learn over time when you observe your core temperature it's it's much better and easier to to maintain a lower temperature than to bring it down like the bringing down it's like forget about that you basically have to stop but you can keep it in check so maybe not follow every crazy attack as for the triathlon you know try to use the downhill passages as as much as possible for cooling down and so on and so forth so don't go like super overheated into the run you will basically heat bonk so basically the athletes have to be much more tactical uh to keep their temperature down because otherwise it's irreversible yeah it's it's almost impossible to bring the temperature really down if you if you still want to compete i mean you can still but what you see then is walking yeah that will bring your temperature down and and some external ice mm-hmm. but yeah, there's there's a couple of stories. Also, then in indoor races, you could really you you'd, you could see that you know people use fans. Then they don't only use one fan, but three fans or five fans, and like <laughs> cold towels and so on and so forth. Stuff you can't do in a normal race. But yeah, it's it's thinking of it afterwards. It's it's so obvious, right? I mean, we're we're kind of a kind of like a combustion engine, and if you had yeah, if you pair a Ferrari motor with a Fiat cooler, you know, you won't have much fun on a German autobahn. <laughs> <laughs> from a product perspective, where do you go from here? Do you think that it's going to, like, frequency improvement is going to help? Or is it different form? Or being on more wearables? How are you thinking about it? I think, I mean, we've we've created now the awareness for the importance of this parameter and um, our mission is to really get this to the people and to the to the athletes and starting with endurance but we we have the idea also in team sports it can be relevant there it's more let's say a, a tactical or safety aspect like who who to substitute you know you don't want to overdo or th- there you can just substitute players you have problems in American football, for example, where you know usually they compete in in autumn and in winter where it's not so hot, but the the training is in in summertime, and then they have a lot of gear as well. So uh, unfortunately, there is almost fatal incidents, uh, at least on the college level, almost every every year, and these could be avoided with with monitoring core temperature more on the endurance space and and going down to to more the the broader base of athletes since we we own all the technology we have all the yeah the way to to cooperate we we similar as for let's say the the heart rate straps you know now every watch has heart rate but still like some people will wear a heart rate strap 
those who are who put more importance on accuracy and so on and that market will will persist and that's what we want to serve directly with core but then by collaborations we're not going to create an own smartwatch but we're looking for to partner find the right partners to bring it to a broader base of of audience and i'm convinced like within the next two to three years we'll we'll have it uh in watches actually on the on the more consumer side we have the first example which is the withings watch that had integrated the technology again it's not as accurate but for a more let's say amateur user it's still insightful and yeah an important parameter for an entrepreneur what's the process of making such a partnership like with withings or with uh, you mentioned it speaking with polar before what's the process of you creating a partnership with them well traditionally we're coming from a b2b business where we are the the center manufacturers and we usually don't serve the end customer um this is really the exception with core so it's it's a normal b2b sales process where you pitch a solution or partial solution you believe there is there's a consumer or end user need or there's a specific problem and and you you pitch your solution and then you get eventually get integrated it's a more lengthy process you don't have everything under control there can be strategic decisions but it's it's a normal business now for the core and the sports domain i think we have no we're recognized in the market on the very top end and we see that there is a demand there is a, yeah demand from our users to to be integrated in in broader ecosystems and so this this really helps us to open doors with the with the relevant players and and get in contact and let's say evaluate different ways of of collaboration which which go beyond a simple let's say um, buying a chip or a license for an algorithm kind of integration mm -hmm. and when it comes to the software side uh, and the LLMs today, I wanted to take your opinion. Do you think that the current LLM models are going to change the type of software that you are going to be creating? Is this going to be useful for you or do you expect other companies to be working on them? That's an interesting question. So uh, probably I'm not the right expert or I have too little experience yet uh, or have seen what's in the market i've seen that some let's say variable companies are, are jumping on it and it just makes sense from a common sense perspective right i mean this is exactly the point where we are at now where we where we saw okay we are going and selling through coaches and it um for their athletes the value becomes very apparent and for the coaches as well but for the normal let's say amateur athletes we we need to provide more we need to provide you know what what does the athlete need how does he need to train and how can he like give the feedback how he improved in his performance and there i see the opportunities with with um yeah, with the LLM, LLMs to to be a more intuitive yeah. or, or faster yeah. way to the goal. It's, it's, it's a question of insights. I think that, yes, indeed, when you have a coach, the coach is going to help you to, to inform you. But then when you go to the uh, amateur, then basically the amateur would need to make their research and educate themselves about uh, that. And I, I'm guessing that LLMs are going to play uh, quite an important role because it's much easier to create the insights there. Now, having said that, you mentioned at the very beginning that during sleep, the temperature actually falls. And I wanted to ask you more specifically about this. Why does it happen? Is it more beneficial to sleep uh, with lower temperatures? Uh, and do you have some information there? What from the few, I'm not an expert, but from the conversations I had with, with some sleep experts, I learned that it the it is an absolute necessity for the body to cool down in order to have like a restful sleep and this explains also why we have why we struggle in in very like if you're more moderate climate and you're not used to heat and you come to a hot climate and you don't have any air condition you really struggle to fall asleep and 
there so the temperature is is the the main parameter for people that have struggled falling asleep so you usually just make your room colder and you it will be much easier to fall asleep and yeah i've just witnessed that when with my little kids so i i brought them to bed and just before you know i'm basically holding them and and then all of the sudden i feel like a heat rush they're getting really hot but what actually happens is they they trying to get rid of heat so they they bring all that blood to the surface and you feel them getting hot but they actually just yeah release heat and then usually like half a uh, half a minute later they're asleep if you feel that if you hold the kid and you feel they're getting really hot then you just have to carry on for <laughs> one more minute and they're they're done so it's somehow, yeah, it, it is, it's just a state where the where it's easier for the body to, you know, slow down with everything. All the metabolism slows down and, and maybe also the regenerative processes are, are working better at that temperature. But it's I don't know the, the biochemical reasons, but mm -hmm. that's what the expert told me. Awesome. Let's speak a bit about the team. In, in Green Tech today in Core as well, what's your philosophy in general about the team and how many people are you and how are you thinking about team building? Well, now in Core, we're roughly 10 people and in Green Tech, we're roughly 40, uh, 40 to 50. So what is, in, well, how, how do I go about team? <laughs> so I, I usually... Um, you know, like people that have have the have the drive themselves, that have some some entrepreneurial mindset, that that are you know ambitious to to take on responsibility and and drive a project themselves. So that's the ideal case. Uh, you don't find that always. Then everybody has its limitations and. Um, then it's really helpful if people accept and and see the, those limitations themselves, because there's no problem with it. You can you can distribute work, you can delegate stuff, but you know you should know where where your boundaries are. That is really helpful, and I think we have a good mix in the team of of like very various background, really diverse, very international, and uh, you'd have to find the right the right person for the right job and yeah and sometimes you need to to readjust uh, that can be yeah because the the environment has changed or the the task has changed so there's different periods in a in the company or or in a yeah in the lifeline of a company where you need need a different skill set and sometimes people can easily adapt to it and sometimes not so then we have to readjust in general yeah, I like the I like to have a culture where where people feel responsible for for their task and and yeah and I I, I have to sense a certain drive. <laughs> Excellent. For my last question, I maybe I'll make it a double question. Um, first of all, if we let's say we speak in five years, where is core going to be? And then the second one is. What's your expectation about the future of sensors and wearables? What, what's going to be happening in the future here? So in five years, hopefully core body temperature is not going to be the, the only parameter or insight we are delivering. We're currently working on um, a couple of other parameters. It's a bit too early to disclose, but which can be quite important both in sports but also in the general health aspect and they're all related to basically the thermoregulatory part of the body which i believe is is a really important and critical uh, function of of health and so i see as core as a brand will have you know a product probably more in the in the let's say high accuracy premium segment and most likely the core temperature will be a commodity that is available in various variables and is just as normal to track as you know as heart rate is today so um, that would be nice it would be nice if it was still associated so with some co-branding to core um, then the general 
wearable space, I see, yeah, a bright future because we we haven't talked too much about the the, the more medical aspect of it. But if if we want to, let's say, break out of the um, ever increasing health cost, yeah, dilemma, we we need to really have the the paradigm shift that that we try to keep people healthy uh, instead of just always only react when when it's already when we're already sick so and the only way we can achieve that is or one of the let's say bats we have is okay we we are we have to we have to monitor healthy people already in order to see any early deviations and give them feedback on how to how to live and eat and in order to stay healthy and i think that's that Variables will play a key role in that, um, and yeah, hopefully we'll have a small a small p- part in that. Excellent, Wolf. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kyriakos. All the best.